All right, we're here with another episode of Live with Greg, and I'm here with the front desk person. <laughs> the greeter. The greeter. Is that the, the official yoga term? studio? Yes, Barbara. And is that all you do is greet? No, we do everything. You we clean the bathrooms? Uh, well, if they overflow, yeah, we'll clean them. You know, in the middle, you know, like during the weekend. It only happens once. We won't go there, though. All right. <laughs> All right. And um, I have been thinking of a title for this that keeps coming up all week. If, the, if I was, a title would be Long Day's Journey into Night. Wow. Are you familiar with that play? I remember seeing it. I remember reading the play like in college. Yeah. I need to uh, maybe reread it. Uh, yeah. Do you think that's an appropriate title for what we're about to do? Well, give me a synopsis really quickly of the play. Uh, so that I don't think the plot's appropriate. Okay. Because the plot is about um, addiction and both um, narcotics and alcohol and the. Uh, um, relationships in this family that are dysfunctional really horribly but the long day's journey into night like sort of disappearing into that fall. Yeah, no that that does seem appropriate Okay. because addiction does have a story in my life alright so let's hear what is that because okay. I didn't know that okay well it's interesting um uh, I have a, a Polish-German background from both parents, and I was born in the Midwest. And the Lestico side of the family, Leistikow, K-O-W, the Polak, Germans. Uh, my dad's uh, family has a riddle history of alcoholism, um, which is unfortunate because Overall, the genes are really good and the longevity is there, but alcohol did ruin so many of um, my parents' siblings. So, needless to say, I believe that it's inherited, just like Huntington disease is an inherited disease, and it is a disease of both the mind and physically, physiologically. Um, my brother and I have it. And being an alcoholic, you're always in recovery. You're never not in recovery. You're never, as Rolando said, well, you've been going to those meetings long enough. I won't even talk about the meetings, but that's no option. This is like, this is keeping me healthy, just like any kind of, um, prescription drug or anything that somebody who had a disease or an illness had to take. So, being an alcoholic and going on my 11th year of sobriety has really enhanced my life. It's made me a different person. And being a care provider for my husband has made me a different person. I'm not the princess. <laughs> I'm not the princess slash career woman. So totally delusional. But I am now my own person. And with the knowledge and with uh, those 11 years of, you know, going through sobriety and learning more and more about myself and also being a care provider learning more and more about myself it's just made me a more fulfilled person not that i'm necessarily happy but i'm content and i would more than happy be content than happy because being happy is just such a you know, elusive, such a quick emotion, but being content and being solid and grounded where you are in life, that's what you hold on to. Yeah. Do 
do you think that your journey as the primary caretaker for Rolando was an equivalent of war or hell or no I made it I made a decision um, on the last night of my drinking my hobby that I was going to clean up and I was going to take care of this person because I knew he, he did so much for me and it was my turn and again I knew that once I got on the other side not knowing how long it was going to be that I was just going to become a better person for it. So you knew Rolando had HD when you decided to be clean and sober 11 years ago. Mm -hmm. Did you know he had HD when you married him? No. Did he know he had HD? No. We knew nothing of the disease. Did he know it was in his family? He knew nothing, nothing. of the disease. So we found out through her, his mother. His mother had it and she was symptomatic. Um, she was symptomatic in the early, early 80s. And it was like, this is Huntington disease. They called it Huntington Korea. Okay. Not everybody has Korea. Rolando had it major, boatloads of it. But it's called Huntington disease. It's not Huntington's Korea or any, but it, um, yeah, no, he didn't know it until his mother was tested. And at that time, they didn't even have the the tests that they had when he was tested. I mean, it was just, just so rudimentary. And that's when he found out through the hospital that, yes, he could have it. And it could be a 50-50. So, I mean, we went on with our life, but that was always kind of there in the closet, so to speak. So you guys didn't talk about it, like, what if kind of things? Uh, yeah, we did a little bit, but we just decided that let's just go on with our life until the symptoms started showing. And then Rolando, of course, because he was the one that had it, was somewhat in denial. It, was terrifying for him, you know, falling down the steps and, you know, just certain things. And he, his mood swings were such that, whoa, Rolando, you do have it. But it was a little denial on him. And I just let it be until he said one morning when he came back from yoga, at his club, he says, I'm being, I'm going to be tested. I'm going to reach out to UCSF and be tested for this disease. And it was his life. It was up to him to decide if he was going to be tested or not. And he was. And of course, he was positive. And um, yeah. And after that test, it, it was um, a whole day of or a half a day with the doctors and then meeting with the um, Andrea um, Zanko, who uh, was the counselor, the genetics counselor. We met with her and then we had to come back for the blood test. We had to really be sure he wanted it because again, it's a very scary thing. And he was tested, tested positive, and it was like, whew, boy, am I glad that's done. And then I guess me being just like the spouse of somebody who's found out they have an incurable disease, it was like, what did I get myself into? <laughs> I didn't sign up for this. Uh, I don't, this is scary. And that's when my addiction really kicked in. Oh. 
So that was about a year and a half into it. And I knew I was an alcoholic because, you know, my, my family genetics. And I knew I did have the problem, but I wasn't ready then. And then I had to be ready, just like anybody who has an addiction. They have to not only know they need it, they have to know they want it. And the only way I realized I wanted it was I had to clean up. I had to clean up. And it was one evening, Rolando was in South America with a friend on a trip for a whole month. And I had my red wine at my bedside. <laughs> Just relaxing. Just reading my book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I spilled the glass all over the carpet. And then it was just click. Really? And a voice came. And I, I always think it's my guardian angel, or me, whatever, saying, now what are you going to do? I'm going to clean up because it's not working. I'm through. And luckily, from then on, it was like I never really had a desire to drink again. I'm like one of the few fortunate ones that never had the craving. It was just like lifted from me. Probably because I knew how much work was going to, you know, I was going to be involved in. So, yeah, so that was 11 years ago and helped Rolando. And I learned so much from taking care of somebody by staying out of the way. I'm not going to fix him. I'm not going to fix anything. I'm going to make it as comfortable as I can for him and me. But he still has his life. And because of that, he still has his dignity. And I am not going to tell him what to do. Because it will be my turn. Everybody has something, Greg, right? Yeah. So I learned from that. That's great. And there were a few times when he, he just said, no, I just don't want you to say anything, just you know, all right. So that kind of backfired on him a few times. Because of his disease, he was very anxious and he would lose his temper a lot. That's one of the characteristics he had, symptoms he had. So he would find himself in social situations where, which were quite uncomfortable. But there was Barbara, just just standing there, like looking at a film, being a spectator, and just watching it. Nothing ever bad happened. If something bad happened to him, I would, needless to say, jump in. But, you know, there were a few times when he was like, come on, come on, help me. And I would just go, just give him a big smile. <laughs> So do you think that was a good choice in that those times? Yeah. Yeah. Like the way he the way his personality is and what he wanted, yes. Remember, I knew this guy for 42 years. Right. So you had 30 years of cell, of marriage without the weight of HD. Correct. Now in that 30 years, do you think that you were a practicing alcoholic? Like was Alcohol. Oh, um, toward toward the end, yes. I mean, because it's just a, it's a progressive disease. Right. The more you do it, the longer you do it, the more it progresses. The disease progresses. If I picked up something, which I would never do, but if I picked up something, it's almost like that disease just stopped right there. And if I picked up something, it would just continue from my last drink. Right. or my last drug. It would just be like that. Right. But on top of that, all the emotional and all the mental knowledge that you have, it would just play havoc with you. You know, because they always say, uh, you know, 
all the knowledge you get through um, recovery um, stays with you. And then if you have that drink, you still carry around all that information on recovery. Yeah. So if you have that drink, you're having that drink with the, the knowledge and knowledge. The knowledge and then also the history of you being sober right. for all those right. years. And there are people that have 20, 30 years sobriety and they go out. Yes. That's so scary. That's enough to scare me. Huh. You know what I mean? I know what you mean. I, like, it could be semantics, because part of my thing is no fear. Like, if fear is our means to... Survival? Survival. I don't think that's healthy. You want to get through that. But I do know what you mean. It's like... You know, the devil's always waiting for that opening. Yeah, it's, I call it the beast. I have the beast. And a few of my friends have, well, that 17-year-old that's on my shoulder still, that has all the answers, yeah. and he's 17. Yeah, yeah. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He wants to kill me. That's you know? so funny. I just yesterday morning experienced that. Woke up with that 17-year-old oh. embodying it. And totally embodied and going, really? Like after everything I've been doing and this is still so... That's funny. Yeah. 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 So how did you... What was your support in the times, especially as Rolando was getting closer and closer to the end, so it's getting more severe, what was your means of personal support to keep going? Well, um... I made a lot of friends. I made a lot of new friends. A, because with his disease, a lot of his close friends at the time, for X reason, I don't know, couldn't deal with it. And they kind of just disappeared. They walked away. And I was starting a new life because I had a, a, a life of sobriety. And because of the life of sobriety, I got very involved in the Buddhist philosophy. So I would be going to XYZ workshops. And so I had that. And then I had my sobriety friends who hang together. And especially one that has been with me from through thick and thin. And in fact, Kitty was with me the night Rolanda passed away. And it was she she wasn't there when he passed away, but before and after. And I have my yoga my samba. So I have several communities that really, really help me. And I'm a stubborn German too, you know, and I'm a, I'm a survivor. I have a strong will and I have a, so. So do you think there was an element of you saying to yourself, I've made this commitment to help my husband to the end and I'm gonna see Yeah, and I didn't so much keep repeating it, it just, I just jumped in, you know, I just jumped in and and he was a learning experience for me because the more I was care providing, if you let it, you'll learn a lot about yourself. Your little triggers and your little idiosyncrasies. So just by being open and present as much as you can from day to day. You do learn a lot about yourself. In becoming aware of your triggers, are you able to heal them, like release them? Uh, it's hard because now I have them and I go, oh, okay, there it is. Okay, there it is, there it goes. Okay, there it goes. Think good thoughts. <laughs> You know, you you think of them, you just don't say it. As the Dalai Lama says, if you can't say anything nice, right. get out of the room. <laughs> or don't say anything, and if you really can't stand it, walk out of the room. Right. And I did a few times. I did walk out of the room a few times. With Rolanda? Yeah. That's okay. I need because, to. you know, now you're dealing with somebody... <laughs> When 
they have HD, he became a six-year-old toward the end, or a four-year-old toward the end. So you're talking to a four-year-old boy, and you're going, and he would say, well, I'm a nice person. And I go, yes, you are. You're a nice person. But you don't always do nice things. And that's what I have to tell you when you're not doing nice things. Because maybe you're not aware of that. Would he hear you? Um, I think so. Overall, he would. Um, unless he, I said something he truly didn't like, and then he just fluffed it off. But, you know, that's just a person. Right. Everyone's you know, everyone's like that. Okay, Daisy, that's <laughs> enough now. So, yeah. Yeah. What would you describe as what comes to mind? First describe. To an individual who is at the beginning stages of that path of caregiving for someone with HD? Reach out. Um, I was fortunate, enough, both, both Rolando and I were fortunate enough to um, be in on um, Andrea Zanko's um, HD group until Rolando just couldn't deal with it anymore. Rolando, during his entire illness, his d entire disease, never took any prescription drugs. He was squeaky clean. None. And a lot of the groups, that's what they talk about. What's the latest drug? that will stop the Korea or this or that or this or that. And finally he just said, I'm not getting anything more out of this, you know, because people are just talking about drugs. And I noticed that too as well when I started uh, uh, to going to an HD care provider group. All they were talking about was what the latest drugs are out on the market. And it was like, well, I'm not getting anything out of it either. Do you think that comes from a fear-based and everyone's looking for that miracle that's going to cure HD? It's hard to say because at this point you don't cure HD. Right. You might dumb it down a little bit, but it's just a cocktail, you know, and it's every every person is different, so every prescription is different and they have a prescription for this and then because this might have symptoms of that because of what they're taking so they take something else and blah 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 and you know in hindsight in the beginning when Rolando said he didn't want to take any drugs I was like well hmm, you know I don't you know don't say that too soon but in the aftermath I really admire him for just sticking to his guns and doing it the way he wanted to do it. You know? Yeah. That takes a lot of guts. I think it almost takes more guts doing what he did and taking the bus into the city four times a week to go to his yoga class. There were yoga classes here, but he decided he wanted to make a journey of it. And there was a studio in the city that he liked. So he did that for years. He did it prior when he had, could drive, and then he, when he couldn't drive, he'd take the bus. And he painted and he photographed for years. He painted pastels until he couldn't paint pastels anymore. So he picked up watercolors. He rode in the bay and he ran and biked in the hills of Marin until he couldn't anymore. And then he picked up yoga. You know, so he always was looking for something to fill it, something to help him. I mean, wow. Yeah. It's pretty incredible. It is. <laughs> You're laughing. I'm laughing because I just thought, Are we going to have a quiet moment now, Greg? Yeah, that's... Yeah, exactly. No, I'm <laughs> laughing because it occurred to me, like, 
that must have helped a lot in you being a caretaker for this individual. To have, you were caretaking for someone who was very conscious in their process. They're still a human. It was, it was still, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And it's a good, it's a, you know, it's a double-edged sword because taking maybe a particular drug would dumb him down to a certain extent, but then he couldn't take the bus. And taking the drug might make my life easier because I wouldn't be conversing with him. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what you call arguments? Conversing? <laughs> Are you having a conversing? <laughs> so it was like, toward the end, toward the end, he just went, you're one tough cookie. And I saw that as a thank you. Yeah. As a thank you. Of course. And believe it or not, in his during his celebration at the end, one of his former friends came up to me and said, Oh now you have a new life, you know? And it's like, No. I had a new life when I started taking care of Rolando. Yeah. And her husband, I know Rolando was channeling him. And he said, you're one tough cookie. <laughs> Thank you, Rolando. Yeah. We're going to have that silent moment. Well, I can right? see tears yeah. in your eyes. Oh, yeah. So there's a lot of love there. Oh, yeah. Definitely. And when he was... Towards the end, you said there was like a six-year-old. And a four-year-old. Four-year-old. And there were like, just occasionally, the Rolando came out. And more often than not, it was intellectually, the Rolando came out. Emotionally, Rolando wasn't there. That part of his brain was going away. How was that for you? It was a journey, you know. I was tired. I was frustrated at times, you know. I mean, and I had to carve out, you know. Okay, I got to do some errands now, so I just basically left, just to get away. I needed my time, mm -hmm. and it was hard. It was hard. People ask me, "Oh, Barbara, what was it like?" It was damn hard. And a friend, a mutual friend of ours, Kim, said, of course, honey, it was damn hard. I know. But it changed me to, for the better, too. And I, I know it, it changed Kim in her own way when she was dealing with Randy. So there it is, you know. It's a new life. I'm an adult now, Greg. I'm not the princess. And the heart's still tender. And the heart is still tender, yeah. It hasn't been that long. It's coming up May 15th. So it would be great if you had your podcast on May, May 15th. It'll be the 11th. Okay. Ha! Close. Close. <laughs> it's always the 11th. That's part of my own oh, okay. discipline. Darn. Is to have it regularly. Okay. Scheduled. All right. <sighs> yeah, you know, I just dealing with, you know, Rolando's disease, you know, I would pick him up in the city at times because A, he would get so flustered. You know, he was incredible. He would take the bus in, and then he would take the bus home for years until he couldn't take the bus home because he was afraid for himself. Somebody who's disabled has a really tough row. They really do. They get so much abuse out in public. It's incredible. You never think about it until you see little glimpses of it. People are mean. Mm. People are mean for X reasons, because they're afraid, 
or they just see a victim there, somebody who's, you know, they can hit on or whatever. But again, he couldn't take the bus ne ne home at that point because he would have to transfer. He would take the underground to take to get to the bus, but that pickup place was in, in the Civic Center. So he had the foresight. I'm going to take Uber. I'm going to take Lyft. So he would take Uber or Lyft from the yoga studio to a safe place on Van Ness. I mean, the guy was working. He was working it. He was working it until he couldn't work it anymore. And he came home uh, September of last year and said, I can't do yoga anymore. It's just too hard. September of the year before. Yeah, of... Um, 27, 20... 20 26, 2017. Okay. Wow. I cannot take it. I can't go to yoga anymore. I can't. It's just... He was exhausted. And he was a twig. His disease, he lost so much weight. He wow. was a twig. That yoga kept him strong. And the difference was incredible from the time he stopped. He went downhill so fast. So everybody... <laughs> there comes the sales Yoga. <laughs> yoga. And some kind of spiritual philosophy is so important. I don't necessarily believe in God. I always say my 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 higher power is a she and her name is Zelda. You know. Whatever works. Right. But everybody is looking for something. And it's important to find it. And everybody's different. Does so go after it. Whatever. <laughs> Whatever it is, <laughs> pinball. <laughs> it's a fever. It works. If it works, do it. Yeah, exactly. Does do you have a story that comes to mind? That's a good example of the difficulty. How damn hard this journey was for you. Oh wow! You know, it's funny when somebody passes away, all the ugly stuff is removed. Um. One, it wasn't necessarily ugly, ugly, but he would get frantic at times and very anxious. And he, in the mornings were especially hard for him because he would wake up totally depressed and totally anxious. That was just... That what, was every morning? Pretty much so. Wow. That's what happened. That's what happened. And there were a number of times where he would be so anxious that he was just grabbing on to anything and everything emotionally. And I was there. So not being able to really talk to him like an adult, I'd be working on my computer. I'm a designer, consultant. And I work from home now, you know, since he's been sick pretty much, well, even before then. Um, and he was like, Barbara, you have to stop and you need to talk to me. And me in the meantime, this, this towering, this towering package I had to finish, I mean, now was due. And... You know, there were occasionally times when I was so tired and had no place to turn that I'd just lash out. Hey, I'm human, right? But you know, that never worked. That never worked. Hmm. Not with him, at least. <laughs> so the best thing I, I learned was just just be in my just be in my body now and just listen to it and just be as objective as I can with this person who is just tormented and is terrified 
And remember, just be a spectator. Don't, in, don't be involved in the vortex of this person because they'll very easily, and not meaning to probably, just take you down. And it could also be like blocking me from leaving. Leaving the relationship? Leaving the house so I can go to work. Okay. Go to yoga. <laughs> you know, um, don't fight it. You don't fight it. You don't, you know, because that's just aggressive then. And you have to just keep that in mind. That this... This man, even though he is a stick, is still strong. And he's stronger than I am. So just be smart about it. So did you find a way... It was a little scary. That was scary. Those, those times were scary. And him waking me up in the middle of the night because he couldn't sleep and he was so anxious. He had nobody to talk to except me. All, most of his friends were gone. He was by himself. If I wasn't here, he was by himself. Did you ever come home and come into a situation that had spiraled because there was no one here? And a little bit. He always seemed to have it pretty much under control. I mean, he would get so overly anxious, he'd be running around the, the apartment. You know, running around the apartment, just running, 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 aimlessly running. But luckily with him, he wasn't violent. And some of them can be very aggressive and hurt. In fact, I know somebody who, whose son hurt her. So it's like, thank you. Thank you, Rolando for being present. And I think, again, it had so much to do with him being clean and not taking drugs. I could be totally off base, but I really believe that because there was nothing else added into the mix, you know, like drugs or anything like that. <clears throat> do you have any story or memory that comes to mind that speaks to the light of the journey? The light. Oh, we had some good times. Funny. You know, I mean, Rolando was Rolando. Some really funny things that happened. I can't think of anything per se off the top of my head, but he was him. You know, and he, we still had the chemistry. I mean, we were best friends. Yeah. I hear you know, a lot of the answer, like Rolando's the star and you're the co-star. You're the supporting actor. There it is. You think that's real? Oh, gosh, yeah. Really? Just ask, you know, like some of our mutual friends that were with us during the, you know, the whole, his whole digression of his disease. Kathy and George, yeah, you know, they would say, oh my God, yeah, yeah. Rolando would be definitely the star, because Rolando was always the star. Even when he was, well, he was the, he was the star. And I was always the co-star. So if we flip that, and you're the star, Mm -hmm. What do you see? Uh, you mean now? No, like... Oh, him? Like in that journey. Oh, if I was the star. Right. Um, well, again, you know, it's like a, a six-year-old kid. They don't want to share it with their mom. They don't want to share it with their sibling. They want it all to themselves. It's all about me, not you, Right. So he would probably get a rather disgruntled, let's say that. Is that what you mean? Well, no, I'm more like if you take the lens and, f and change the focus. So now you're the star of the journey. Mm -hmm. And it's really your journey we're looking at. Okay, so 
What do you want to know, Greg? What do you mean? What, what comes to mind? <laughs> well, I was the, I was in for the ride because I knew I was going to get something out of this. I was going to learn a lot from this whole situation. Uh, that's coming up a lot, like, yeah. And that's, and I loved him too, you know? There wasn't any question about that. But I have no idea what my life is going to be like. It's going to be totally different, but I don't know what it is yet. I'm in the process of finishing yoga training. I don't want to be an instructor per se, but just that journey in itself was for me. Going to the dentist after all those years. You know, all that work was for me. And it's really interesting because now you're saying this, it's all flipped on me now. And I'm sad. I'm sad now. I'm more sad now than I was getting, you know, throwing things out and organizing after he passed or getting things in line for an apartment or getting things in line for a car or whatever, blum, blum, was outside. It was, it was busy work. You know what I mean? Yeah. And now it's for me. And I really, it's really hitting me hard now. And also it's coming up to be one year, too. So, we're going to look at each other now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just feeling your sadness. I can wonder. It's, it's been hard. Um, yoga training has been very hard because again that was for me and you know since it's been started I told um, uh, my instructor I said you know you don't you cannot believe how my emotions are hitting me now and it's so hard for me to study and learn all the sutras and the philosophy and the anatomy and all of that. When I just, after practice or after work, want to go home and take a nap. And I take a nap and I wake up at 8 at night. You know? I need it. I guess I need it. So it's going to be what it's going to be, Michelle. Sorry. But... <laughs> I'm trying the best I can. It's like that duck in the water that's getting very close to the waterfall. <laughs> My anchor falls and you're, <laughs> you're trying to swim against the current. What do you think would happen if you stop swimming and go over the falls? Um, uh, probably nothing. Probably nothing. And I'm learning a lot for myself. It's like well, I'm going to do the best I can do, but I might not take that final exam because I might not really be ready for that. And that's okay. And so that was a hard thing for me to, to realize because I'm the type of person, like Rolando, no more so. When I start something, I finish it. The German. <laughs> The machine. <laughs> the machine, exactly. <laughs> Dot all of your I's and cross all of your T's. Test June 16th. <laughs> Roger that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, with all of this, I'm continuing my journey. I'm learning yeah. about myself. And it's like, wow, wow, I never knew that ego would play such a big part in this. In your personal journey? In my personal journey, <laughs> and it does. But you gotta remember, Greg, when you're a care provider, it kind of, it's a little 
It's all about caring. It's all about person. caring. Right, right. And it's survival for you. Right. It's like, well, I'm going to take that walk, you know, or whatever. Or I'm going to go to yoga or whatever. And now it's just all me. You're your own caregiver. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes you're a six-year-old or four-year-old screaming out, and you, the adult, have to <laughs> just witness. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. And I'm 65. No time like the present. Exactly. And I know there's something different out there for me. Again, I don't know what it is. Right. And it's it's exciting, but it's scary. Yeah. You know, it's all of that. Whew. I feel that. Well, is there anything more that you would like to share that hasn't been brought up? And of course, this evening when I'm reading, I'll think of it and go, oh my God, I should have said this or that or this or that. Um, no, just be true to yourself. And when people ask you how you're doing, <laughs> you got to be honest with them. <laughs> whether they, whether they want to hear it or not, because they did ask. And it's for you then. Yeah, I find my difficulties in knowing how I'm really doing. Sometimes it's it's true. It's a quagmire sometimes. Yeah. yeah I agree. I agree. It's a beautiful world. For you. It's a beautiful world. Not me. It's a beautiful world.